Welcome to The Economy Magazine at I-24 News, where we take a look at the most fascinating stories in global business and innovation. I'm Natalie Ehrlich. Well, coming up today, Cuba's government expands free Wi-Fi, and Myanmar's bottled water market is set to boom. But first, let's start with the headlines. Well, in a sudden change of tone on Sunday, the Greek Prime Minister, Minister Alexis Tsipras made a new offer on reforms to foreign creditors. The twist in the Greek debt story comes after months of tense standoff between Greece's leftist government and Europe. EU officials expressed optimism ahead of emergency talks on Monday evening, but European Commission President Jean-Claude Juncker remained cautious, saying progress had been made in recent days, but a final solution wasn't quite there. In the days leading up to the summit, anxious Greek depositors could be seen pulling billions of euros out of Greek banks. Since the surprise move, European stocks and bonds surged on hopes that Greece and Europe would finally be able to reach a last-minute deal. Well, in South Korea, business leaders held an emergency meeting on Monday discussing ways to boost the economy in the wake of the deadly MERS epidemic. Since the outbreak emerged in late May, this virus has claimed the lives of 27 people. Though the spread of the disease has slowed since early June, fears continue to drag domestic consumption. The CEO of Doosan Group, Park Young-man, called for greater coordination by the business community. Now businessmen should work together to quell the worries over MERS as soon as possible. This is why the Korea Chamber of Commerce and Industry is announcing plans for economic rejuvenizing now and we're trying to put our plans into action. Natural gas pipeline giant Williams Companies has rejected an unsolicited buyout offer of $48 billion from Energy Transfer Equity LP but signaled it was open to other offers. Williams didn't identify who made that bid. Meanwhile, Energy Transfer confirmed early on Monday morning that it had tried to engage with Williams management for nearly six months, but so far had been ignored. The all-equity bid, valued at some $53.1 billion, including debt and other liabilities, would require Energy Transfer to issue new shares. Well, shares of Williams have risen 7.8 percent so far this year to $48.24. Energy transfer shares are up 19 percent so far at $68.39. Well, European foreign ministers agreed to extend economic sanctions on Russia by six months until the end of January 2016. This decision was approved on Monday in response to Russia's involvement in Ukraine and its annexation of Crimea. The Kremlin said the sanctions were unfounded. Well, since the measures were first imposed in the summer of 2014, five major state-owned banks, three energy companies, and also three major defense firms were hit especially hard. Russia's economy is expected to shrink 3.5 percent in 2015, this according to the IMF, in part due to these sanctions and also weak oil prices. And Italian prosecutors want to indict the Bank of China's Milan branch and almost 300 people over a money laundering scheme. Florentine prosecutors allege 4.5 billion euros earned through prostitution, counterfeiting, tax evasion, as well as labor exploitation were transferred to China, also indicating that four senior managers with the Bank of China could be indicted. Well, close to half of the monies transferred between 2007 and 2010 went through this Milan branch. And Bank of China received over 700,000 euros in commission for these transfers. Amid the thaw in U.S.-Cuban relations, the government is now setting up a number of hotspots for free Wi-Fi, as Daniel Roth reports. Since Cuba and the United States have begun the process of thawing relations and the U.S. embargo has loosened, money and people are finding their way into Cuba even before travel restrictions are fully off the table. Now information is beginning to flow more freely as well. The Cuban government is planning to set up Wi-Fi hotspots in 35 public spaces throughout the island in what will surely be a major shift for many Cubans who have endured expensive and sparse web access. The price for going online will also drop from $4.50 per hour to $2 U.S. If the price is lowered, then it would be a very good option. This is very favorable. It's very accessible for all of us. While U.S.-based Internet companies such as Google are finding their way into the Cuban market as the U.S. loosens its embargo, the island, which has one of the highest literacy rates in the world, has one of the lowest Internet usage rates in the world, according to the Reuters report. 
Most homes aren't connected, only 3.4 percent, and many of those to the intranet, not internet, according to the UN telecom agency. While this will be a big step forward into the digital age, some say it doesn't go far enough. In general, it's a very positive measure, but the price still has to drop by a lot. Two dollars is still too high for an average Cuban. The Wi-Fi access is a first step in what will most likely be a long process on the island of 11 million people. Each of the 35 hotspots will be able to handle between 50 and 100 users with a one megabit per second per user speed, a fairly slow start. Staying now with the internet, there is a part of it that is completely hidden. Google-like search engines only sweep about 30 percent of the web, making the rest a prime place for illegal business activity. Just a few weeks ago, the operator of Silk Road, a multi-million dollar marketplace for illicit drugs, got a life sentence. Now NASA is working to make sense of that very part of the internet, commonly known as the dark or deep web. For further insight on the space agency's latest work in that area, we were joined earlier by Chris Matman, a senior computer scientist at NASA and lead on this project. Describe to us what is the dark web? Yeah, no problem. So, you know, it's got two components to it. There's the dark web and the deep web. The, the dark web is part of this sort of new hidden internet, which they needed sort of a special uh, way to access. You need a special browser. And what people are doing on that is they're selling any type of, you know, illicit good. You know, they're selling people's organs. They're selling guns. You know, they're selling people and trafficking them and things like that. And so that's, you know, a really bad part of the Internet, you know, that we're helping to sort of search and investigate. And it's sort of a newer part of the Internet. The other part that NASA is really interested in as well is, is called the, it's sort of called the deep web. And, and what it is, is it's the fact that there's a lot of data out there, images, videos, uh, science data and things like that, that most traditional web crawlers and search engines and browsers don't access. And, and so typically the adage that I give people is that, you know, at any, at any time in the deep web, you know, you're about 20 to 40 clicks away from the actual thing that you're looking for. And we're trying to reduce that uh, to about two to four clicks. Well, what technologies are you actually developing to help reduce that? Yeah, no problem. So uh, one of the, the name of the game for us is building open technologies or open source and, and things like that. And so we contribute a lot to software at the Apache Software Foundation, which is a worldwide organization. And we're kind of unique in terms of at least the government and, and stuff at NASA in being able to do that. And DARPA has been really supportive of us doing that. And so we're building new types of web crawlers. We're building technologies that will parse and understand information from images and videos and other types of content and make connections that, you know, the, the traditional sort of search engines like Google and Bing uh, don't capture. Well, what are the economic implications of the dark web in your uh, view? They're huge. I mean, yeah, they're, they're really huge. Um, you, you know, people are using anonymized money to buy and trade and sell these types of sort of illicit goods and other things. They're using things called Bitcoin. Bitcoin is a, is a popular anonymized sort of way of, of doing, um, doing business now. And it, it had a lot of, it had huge implications sort of in the U.S. We had hearings, you know, on it uh, where they were trying to sort of study the impact. And it makes it really hard to sort of trace, you know, what's paying for what and things like that. And of course, as you mentioned, you know, things like the Silk Road, you know, out there, it was, you know, it was a huge industry. You know, we're talking about, you know, tens of millions of dollars being exchanged and things like that. And, and with Bitcoin and the ability of to use it as sort of a currency right now to buy other things, it's, it's becoming really hard to track. Well, do you think that we're going to see more regulation coming on this front? Yeah, I, I absolutely do. I mean, I think people are trying to get their, you know, hands around sort of, uh, you know, trying to figure out what money is going to where. And that's part, part of sort of what we're trying to figure out sort of at some level. That's the defense agency sort of, that's DARPA's interest uh, in some of these things. Um, you know, beyond that, they're also just trying to find out, like, what sites are out there, you know, especially on, on the dark web and things like that. We don't have, like, a, you know, a search engine for that. Uh, it's just, you know, we can't type, like, you know, dark web Google or something, you know, and then figure out kind of what's in there. Uh, and see the sites come back. So, you know, if you can imagine doing something like that or building a system like that, that's kind of the path that we're going down. Well, this all sounds very sinister. Thank you very much for your work and your insight, Chris Matman, for coming on the program. Thanks for having me. Thanks, Natalie. 
Switching gears a bit onto a different subject, only 60 percent of people living in Myanmar's largest city have access to running water. But as the country's economy booms in the wake of democratic reforms, so has the market for bottled water. They're not beehives or modern art, but a public amenity. These boldly colored water jars on the streets of Yangon are there to provide relief for thirsty passers-by. They're refilled by local monks, market traders and other citizens in an old tradition that survives to this day. It's a good system. It's easy to use. It's a good way for people to quench their thirst. Water donors make good deeds. People can drink this water when they get thirsty. Only 60 percent of Yangon's five million people have access to running water at home. And as Myanmar's economy booms in the wake of democratic reforms, so has the market for bottled water. But regulation is still minimal, and dozens of local brands were recently banned on health grounds, leaving the way clear for companies like this one, which hopes to produce 300 million bottles this year. Previously, a lot of small players, they don't care for the water treatment. They just get it from maybe underground or from uh, the pipe from the city water. They just uh, treat it very lightly. But as I have experience from other countries, the quality of water can have impact on the general population. But after decades of neglect under military rule, Myanmar's entire water system, like much of its infrastructure, is in dire need of modernization. In Yangon, a French engineering firm has drafted plans for cleaning and repairing thousands of kilometers of rusty pipes. The whole network actually has to be renovated, at least uh, part of it. The part that is too old or too damaged or where contamination risks uh, are the biggest. But that process could take up to 20 years. In the meantime, parched pedestrians can rely on the kindness of strangers to quench their thirst. And for the stories we didn't want you to miss, we are joined on set by Daniel Roth. Thank you for being with us. So what do you have for us today? A radical story from TechCrunch. Well, it's not that radical. It's a guy who tried to get a startup going, he tried to get a startup started, and failed miserably, and is writing to all of the would-be billionaire entrepreneurs out there saying, hey, stop don't drop out of school. Uh, I, you know, we know that there are these success stories, the Mark Zuckerbergs, uh, the, you know, the, the call from Peter Thiel to, to, uh, for people to drop out of school and pursue your ideas. But he notes 80% of startups fail in the first 18 months. And people need to be uh, uh, starkly aware of these numbers because the chances are if you drop out of school, you're going to fail in your startup uh, 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 entrepreneurship projects. Well, this is actually counter to what Peter Thiel has been pushing for now for years. Right, and Peter Thiel, you know, of course, is uh, is a billionaire investor uh, who is he actually runs a project pulling people out of Ivy League educations uh, and putting them into, into a situation where they can start their startups. Uh, now, what this author is saying is you won't necessarily fail, but this idea that everyone's going to become a billionaire is patently false. It's a pipe dream. It's perhaps the new digital American dream. Uh, but it's not going to happen for most people. It takes money to go to school, certainly, but it also takes money to get a project off the ground. So one of the questions that we're asking is, is uh, where is the investment going? Is it going to school? Is it going to education? And what would is, be the better investment? Well, the, the jury's out. The, uh, the, the numbers all say that your salary will go up as soon as you have a degree. The higher your degree, the, the bigger your salary. The question is, are you following your dreams? Are you building the thing that you want to be building? And that's that's really the question at the end of the day. Indeed, and certainly doesn't hold true if you're Bill Gates or Mark Zuckerberg. But what else do you have for us? Uh, so this is a this is actually a radical proposal. This is in the Guardian in the Communist Free section. Uh, this is an author who's uh, telling the world about the sharing economy, something many of us already know: the Airbnbs, the Ubers, uh, these kinds of networked projects. Net 
networked companies that really run on the juice of having a lot of people involved. So Airbnb really wouldn't uh, you know, re be able to replace the hotel industry if it didn't have a lot of people on their network, but they do. And what this guy's actually proposing is very, very interesting. He's saying public entities, governments primarily, should start using these sharing economy platforms as not-for-profit platforms for creating access to services for people. And then we would really uh, what he, uh, he see what he calls dot communism, uh, something that would really lift everybody up, which is something that may be at the core of these technologies. Well, fascinating point there, and certainly no shortage of radical articles from you. We do appreciate it here, as always, at The Economy Magazine. That wraps up our show today. Do stay tuned for all the latest in global business and innovation tomorrow. From the Joff Report in Tel Aviv, I'm Natalie Ehrlich. Thank you.